Hey guys, today we're talking about structures. So we're gonna talk about what structures are, the functions of different profes professions in structures, the part of the structure, components of concrete and steel structures, and the use of formwork. So structures, they relate to buildings, bridges, and dams, which serve many purposes. For construction per, uh, process, is concerned with a rational and economic use of resources. The resources we talk of are the five M's, man, material, machine, money, and method. The design process is concerned with the size and shape, the nature and form of the building, the loading parameters, and the material that is used. Construction process is concerned with the nature and sequence of operations, and the environmental issues it faces. The weather, the fires, temperature, sound, and wind. That's everything you need to uh, look at when you are busy in the construction phase of structure. Professionals involved with, with buildings are architects, quantity surveyors, structural engineers, and geotechnical engineers. Architects design the structure to meet the needs of a client and perform standards. The structure should be aesthetically pleasing and environmentally sensitive and safe. So that's what the architect does. He draws a nice picture, uh, so it looks like the client wants it, and it also complies with eco-friendly stuff. The structural engineer goes into the design of the structural requirements for the building. Example, the foundation, the beam, the slabs, the roof structures uh, within safety limits. And this consists of a substructure and a superstructure. I think we spoke about substructures and superstructures in the bridges slide. Structures can be built using different structural forms. Reinforced concrete, structural steel, and precast concrete. So plain concrete, what is it? It's a mixture of cement, fine aggregates, coarse aggregates, and water. Always remember that, you'll always need to know that. The factors in affecting concrete strength is the type of cement, the type and size of aggregates, clean mixing, water admixtures used, and water cement ratio. Then you also get reinforced concrete. So that's that plain concrete with a reinforced steel in that. The requirements for the steel to be used is high tensile strength, easily bent to form shapes, and it's surface must be capable of forming a bond between steel and concrete. That bond is important. So this is the two types of steel bars you get. You get mild steel, you'll see there's no, no Y shape on it, or no ridges on there. High tensile has these ridges. You can read up a little bit more on page 39 of your textbooks. These shape codes you'll always see whenever you do work on buildings and whenever they are busy with the formworks, you'll know what bending, what bending number you are working on. So the engineer would say, okay, the bottom bar I want on shape 33, uh, top bar, please do it on a shape 20, and then the two sides should be on, let's say for this scenario, 42. During placing of bars, the following should be checked by the resident engineer. He has to check if the correct bars are being used. Obviously, that is very important. Then the proper bar diameter, that is always specified. I'll tell you now how you see that. And the bars are fixed as designed. Concrete cover to steel is specified as well. The design process, you consider the self-weight and the imposed load on a member. You calculate the reactions and the effects of it. You calculate the bending moments, shear forces, and area of steel required, and prepare a detailed drawing of the construction. So this is a typical way of how they would show it. You'd get a code like this that says 8Y20012501, and you didn't need to know how to read that in order to actually place the right steel. The structural engineers and the guys on site know this out of their head, this whole code. You guys need to please study up on this. So you'll get eight, which is the total number of bars in the group. Y high is high tensile. 20 is a bar diameter. Then you get zero one is the bar mark number. 
250, which is a center to center spacing in millimeters, and then a location of steel reinforcement. So what I want you to look up a little bit further to for me is how would this code look if it isn't for high yield steel round bar and if it's for mild steel or any other steel for that matter. Then you get reinforced concrete beams. It's a structural element that is capable of withstanding load per preliminary by resisting bending. Beams generally carry vertical gravitational forces but can also be used to carry horizontal loads. And this is with earthquakes and winds. The loads carried by a beam are transferred to the columns, walls, or girders, which then transfer the force to adjacent structural compression members, which is usually uh, foundations and things like that. So the beams that I want you to know, the ones that you will be able to draw for me as well, is a simply supported beam, which is this one over here, number B, or letter B, continuous, which is D, cantilever, A, overhanging, C, and then fixed ended, which is E. I can also put a couple of them together and ask you to draw that, like in F. Reinforced concrete slab. So we just spoke about slabs. Now a concrete slab is a common, or we spoke about beams, we're talking about slabs now, is a common structural element, often used to construct floors and ceilings in multi-story buildings, while thinner slabs are also used for exterior paving. You can read up a little bit more on page 49. Columns. So columns can be expressed explained as an engineer and as an architect. So know the difference between them. A column in a structural engine in structural engineering is a vertical structural element that transmits through compression the weight of the structure above to other structural elements. So it's talking all about the load is transmitted through this vertical element to other other elements. Architecture, a column refers to such a structural element that also has certain proportional or decorative features. It's not always something that carries a load through to the rest of the building. Sometimes it's literally just a horizontal pillar. That's how an architect explains a column. Okay, so there's a couple of examples of a lot of columns. This was actually built on CUT. Then structural steel form. So we've been talking about concrete. Next one, we're talking about steel. Uh, it has the same elements of the buildings, but all these reinforced concrete are now replaced with structural steel members. And this is usually used for bridge construction, portal frames, trusses, and girders. They are easy to assemble. They are relatively expensive compared to reinforced concrete not very labor intensive which is a lot of times required in south africa if you do get a tender that it should be labor intensive and then columns and beams are bolted together please know the names of all of these parts from eaves and haunches to Berlin apex rafter and the horn here at the top as well columns base pinned or fixed all right all you need to know is it's a base, it can be pinned or fixed. Then you go into section types. You get a universal beam, which is usually an I section, which is down here in the middle. Then you get a universal column, which is usually an H, uh, H section. Then you get a rolled steel joints. You get angles, you get channels, and then you get T sections. Then connections. Connections is an easy way of just saying how do you uh, bolt or weld these uh, sections together? How do you weld your column to your beam or bolt it together? You get different connections. You get a pin, a pin or hinge connection, a base connection or a pocket connection. The materials they use in these connections are either bolts or welding. These are different things they do use to simulate this. This is now on Revit. You can also use Procon to do the rest of that, and that's how it looks on site. Precast concrete forms. So precast concrete products, uh, read more up on page 56. 
You can get septic tanks, manholes, box culverts, which is this picture here next to this, channels, pre-stressed bridge beams, bridge decks, and concrete road barriers. There are a couple of advantages and disadvantages to pre-cast pre concrete. Uh, the mixing, placing, and curing is done under controlled conditions, so you always know you get the right concrete. There's no need for sections on site to produce concrete, and the cost can be reduced if you do use this correctly. The disadvantages are no pre-casting for large sections. I only do small sections at a time. Cranes will be needed, so maybe a little bit more money on equipment. Precise measurement is required as well, and then it needs to be delivered. So usually if it's too far away from a city, the money is gonna be a lot to get these precast so. Then we go to scaffolding. There's a lot more information on page 58 to 60. I'm just gonna give you the introduction. Scaffolding is a, a temporary structure for which people can gain access to high level working areas to carry out construction operation. The forms of scaffolding is a pot log or independent scaffold, and you'll see now what it is. Uh, you can make it from different materials, which is a tubular steel or aluminium, and then timber. Uh, so that's the pot log, and that is the independent. The main purpose here is the pot log. Basically, that means it ties to your building, and the independent one actually stands on its own, it still ties just for safety. Form work, it's described as a mold of box into which wet concrete is poured. The materials they use for this is plywood, clipboard or steel forms. And they should have 15 to 20% moisture content. There's a very, very important reason for this actually to have a bit of moisture in it. If it is too dry, it takes out a lot of moisture from, from your concrete and it dry, the concrete dries out too quickly. If it's too wet, it adds moisture to your concrete and it doesn't dry out. So that's very important. You can read up a little bit more on that on page 60 to 64. And then there's a formwork checklist. They are strong. You should make sure they are strong enough to support wet concrete. They must not deflect under loads. They must be accurately set out properly properly sealed, easily handled, and easily fixed. Formworks, possible defects. Uneven color or blow holes. So sometimes the, if there's rocks in the wrong places, you get sections that don't actually have concrete in it. So you get a couple of formwork types. Important, this section, really look in your book. I just name a cut all these parts that I want you to know for me. If I did ask you to draw a beam, a beam formwork, you'd need to also put all these names next to it as well. So please do read up on that. So the different types you get is a foundation formwork, a column formwork like this, and then you also get a beam formwork. Slab, slab formwork as well. Like you can see here, there's a little guy there at the bottom holding everything up or actually putting up the formwork. He, he won't do really well if he had to keep the slab up. Okay, then going into the last section, not a lot left, concrete compaction. During the transfer, transfer placing process, uh, possible occurrences are segregation, uh, contamination of concrete, and then premature stiffening. This is a segregation. You can see all the parts aren't sticking together. They are segregated from one another at the back. They can be transported or placed by a wheelbarrow, dumper, crane and skip, and ready mixed concrete. Concrete compaction. During placing process, the you have to follow these rules. No concrete should be dumped on the formwork. Place close to the final position. Do not use the concrete to a vibrator to move the concrete. Pour at a steady rate. On an inclined surface, you work from the bottom upwards and no dropping the concrete for more than three meters because that causes segregation. All the rocks move to the bottom of the concrete. Concrete compaction, you get mechanical vibration. There's three ways. You get internal vibration, external vibration, and then surface vibration. Internal vibration, uh, compaction is completed when there's no bubbles, is a glossy appearance and vibration sounds changes. You can actually hear the sound of the concrete. Then uh, external vibration. This is often in the precast industry. They directly apply 
the vibration to the external of the formwork. This isn't a vibration table, a vibrating table. You can maybe uh, look up at what it is. That one specifically called is a big bag vibrator, but that's not the actual name for it. You can maybe read up what that is called. Then you get surface vibration, and it's mainly applied for slabs. That's how that looks. It looks like a fan turned upside down. Okay, last bit. Brickwork and bonding. It is important to follow brickwork prescribed code practice for recognized pattern or bonds. The common bonds are the stretcher bond, which is the one we all know. Halfway through your normal brick, you add another brick at the top. Then you get an English bond, which uses uh, your brick's head on the, in the one row and then the face on the other side. Okay, that's usually for a double wall. And then you also get a Flemish bond, which, yeah, it's a bit confusing, but not too, too confusing to look at. Okay, guys, that's it then for today.